Good morning and welcome to the sixth webinar in the series building up to our summer fair taking place on 22nd of June at the Honeyham Club. And today we'll be discussing the prospects for British independent schools in the 21st century. And to do this we have an eminent panel of leading figures from the sector. Barnaby Lennon, now chairman of the Independent Schools Council, was among many things formerly headmaster of Harrow. Dr Tim Hans is headmaster of Winchester College. Dr. Gary Savage is headmaster of Westminster School, and Sally Ann Huang, who's not actually joined us yet, and I suspect has been delayed by something happening at school, is high master of St. Paul's School. Uh, in some ways, this might seem a strange set of schools to think about the future. After all, they're most well known for their eminent histories. Uh, Westminster and Winchester were founded in the 14th century, St. Paul's was founded early in the 16th century. However, although um, independent schools, some independent schools have a long history, this can disguise the fact that this is a sector that's constantly in flux. I grew up in Worcestershire in the 1970s, and the county at that point had a huge number of independent schools. Malvern alone had 20 preference senior schools. Some were medieval foundations, others were Victorian or 20th century in origin. All were single sex. Many of the prep schools were small owner-run boarding schools with fewer than 100 pupils. Uh, I attended an independent school in Worcester, where many children had free government-funded direct grant places. Hard to recall that at this time, there was a definite blurring of the sectors, uh, and independent schools faced some deep existential threats. Indeed, in 1979, just before general election, my headmaster told parents at speech day that if Labour won a second term, the sector would be finished. The Independent Schools Council, which Barnaby chairs, was founded in 1974, as the Independent Schools Joint Council to lobby for the sector and to try to ensure its survival. It was incredibly successful, uh, but, but an enormous amount of change has happened in the sector since, since the 1970s. In Malvern, for example, there are now a handful of schools, mostly co-ed, and, and, and uh, with one exception, they're all through, school, through schools. None of the small owner-run schools survive, and the town no longer has crocodiles of prep school borders going for walks. So there's been an awful lot of change in the last 50 years. And today we're gonna to talk about what might happen in the next 20, 30 years. But we're gonna start uh, by talking to the heads about uh, lockdown, which is a, a, a world historic event of a very unpredictable kind and find out how it's been for, for their schools. So I'm gonna start uh, by asking uh, Gary how it's been for Westminster. Well, thank you very much indeed, Guy, and uh, good morning, everyone, um, both uh, fellow panellists and members of the audience. It's good to be here. Um, lockdown has been uh, inevitably uh, hugely challenging, although we're still upright and we're still smiling. Um, obviously, we have a significant contingent of borders, uh, both London-based and international borders at Westminster, and uh, for the latter in particular, things have been incredibly complicated trying to negotiate, as we've all tried to do in our different ways of life, um, international restrictions and their ebb and flow. So that's been a challenge. Our priority, of course, has been to make sure that we continue to look after them, to make sure that they feel nurtured and safe and welcome. Um, and I think we managed to do that by putting lots of time into their well-being and checking in on them, whilst at one point during the winter term, putting everything online again, which, uh, and I'm sure I say this in common with all of my colleagues on the call today, and indeed schools in general, we are now very used to doing and adept at doing and have managed to transition to and from online teaching and learning very effectively. But what that lacks, of course, is the human interaction and the warmth and the spark and the energy that comes from being in a community together. And there's no doubt that we've all missed it. We're thrilled to be back now. And we're working hard to make sure that the children who particularly found lockdown difficult and online experience difficult are being reintegrated and reintroduced to life in three dimensions again. So in short, tough, a challenge, no doubt, but one that I think we were well equipped to, to deal with, to respond to, and to keep the children at the, at the heart of all our thinking. And, uh, and I'm pleased that we've done that. And hopefully now the worst is behind us. Let's hope so. Yeah, I think everyone thinks, hopes that. Don't they? I mean, do, do you think um, uh, that that I mean, you talked about how you've moved to online teaching. Will you will you carry on online teaching in in some form, or is that we um, 
there are there are things that I think that we've we've um, we've done this year that we think are worth continuing. Um, since I arrived, as you may or may not know, but I've I've only been at, uh, head at Westminster since September. Um, though I was a deputy head here a long time ago. Um, one of the things we are developing are, are links with other schools and universities around the world, um, United States, uh, Europe, China, and elsewhere. And those interactions are currently online with faculty and with students. And they will continue to be so because it works. Zoom works for that purpose. Um, and I think uh, there are elements like that that will continue to be usefully online. But a lot of what we do will happily return to three dimensions because I think it's important. Um, there is an awful lot to be said for the, the warmth of human relations and schools are relational places. If, if schools are above all cradles for the development of, of, of character, of humanity, um, of liberal values and a, and, a, and, a, and a positive and healthy outlook on life and on the world, and you need to be on site to do that. So much will return, some will remain online, um, and, uh, and some practical things will as well. We'll probably retain a lot of our parents' evenings uh, online because it suits busy people. Uh, you can you can achieve more without the travel time as long as you compensate for that with other pastoral and social moments for parents to be part of the community and to be on site which is important that business element of an academic uh update parents evening i think is well served by zoom again so that too will endure yeah i mean i, I, I having done online parents evening i think they're great you don't have to queue up this is sitting on the sofa. Completely fantastic. Tim, you were talking before we started about um, about numbers of overseas students who, who, who'd come over, who, who made it into the UK. Do you want to comment on that? Um, well, obviously, as Gary says, it's been exceptionally difficult for uh, overseas um, students, and indeed, some of them have not been able to, to be here. Um, we have one boy who lives in Australia. Uh, his father is a diplomat, and it was a great pleasure to welcome him back uh, in the, literally from the other end of the earth. I think to answer your first question, um, uh, the lockdowns taught us the efficiency of science. We bought a Samba 2 machine at the start of this. It's meant that we've been able to keep um, the, the, the horrible uh, global pandemic uh, entirely out. We've not missed a single day of teaching. Um, it looks a bit like a Moulinex mixer, but it's a bit more expensive. Uh, uh, but what it's also shown us is, is the joylessness of screens and, as Gary says, the lack of the warmth of, of human interaction. Um, uh, what's been the benefit? Well, the benefit, I think, is that although we're grateful to William of Wickham when he founded the school in 1382 for a lot of things, we're not particularly pleased with his IT network. We, we needed to do a massive uh, digital enhancement, which we just got done in time. And, and as Gary says, we've learned a huge amount about new ways of teaching, new ways of communicating, new ways of doing things. And um, that, that's moved us forward, you know, um, several years in a few months, uh, I would say. Um, and likewise, you know, we've all had to be better at comms. So it's been very difficult. It's been very um, uh, uh, demanding, but uh, it's, it's had its terrible losses, but there have been one or two things that we've learned. Great, thanks. Sally Ann, anything you'd like to add? No, I, I would echo everything that Tim and Gary have said. I think we've had a very similar um, experience. And, and I share with Gary the fact that I moved schools partway through the pandemic. So I saw a response at one school and then inherited a response at another. So I can see that there are common journeys. Um, I, I think for me, what this pandemic has proven, I'm a great believer in silver linings, is really how flexible and able teachers are. Um, and I think a lot of teachers would have lacked the confidence um, if you had said to them 18 months ago, this is going to happen and you're going to change your teaching styles and you're going to be upskilled in terms of your IT, they would say, oh, we'll need two years to develop that program or I'm not ready yet or this is why it won't work. But they did all cope. Um, they did brilliantly. And I think in the independent sector, we did particularly brilliantly because when the pandemic hit, there was this fear that people wouldn't want to pay fees in schools that looked as though they were closed because the site was closed. And actually the independent 
sector rose to that challenge really well and taught brilliantly. So I think if the pandemic has proven anything, it's proven how flexible, agile and able our teaching bodies are. But also, I think um, it's proven how, how valuable teachers are. I mean, remember, you would read those articles with AI and online learning. Would, would we need teachers? But as, as Gary has said, nothing replaces that in-person relationship that, that you have with the teacher. So I suppose my summary is I just feel teachers have come out really well. And I hope that they will be appropriately valued uh, from this point on. Barnaby, the, the, at the beginning of, of, I mean, just to pick up what Sally was saying about, about fears at the start of this, there was a lot of talk about um, schools having a catastrophic loss of fee income. Is that, has that been the experience of the sector or has it held up all right? Okay, you're right. So back in um, March 2020, there was a widespread assumption that independent schools were going to be very, very severely hit. Um, and they have been hit financially because many of them felt that they needed to maintain very strict control over their fees. I mean, the fee increase this year was, was below inflation. It was 1%. Uh, so they have, they have suffered a bit economically. But the plain fact is that uh, when the Independent Schools Council did our survey this January 2021, we found that the number of pupils had fallen by only 3,000 out of 537,000. And some schools are looking at a really significant increase in demand for this coming September. So although it has been hard, and obviously it remains hard for overseas borders, and the, you know, in the short term, there has been some loss of overseas borders, overall, it's miraculously better than anyone assumed it would be a year and a half ago. Brilliant, thanks. Um, let's move on to the curriculum. Um, I mean, there's an awful lot of talk at the moment about the shape of the curriculum. Um, do you think, uh, so I'm gonna ask uh, um, Sally Ann to start this one off. Do you think um, the general shape of the curriculum in your school is going to stay the same? Are new subjects emerging? Is anything dying? I know you're a classicist, so. Yeah, no, I'm a classicist, so you can talk to me about dying subjects. I mean, I, I think in some ways it's not about particular subjects as much as it's about, again, that flexibility that we've learned to teach things in different ways. And we're all looking very closely um, at what will happen with GCSEs and A-levels and whether they can really be put back together again in the form that they historically took or whether actually that structure is has been proven to be outdated. I mean, I think a number of heads would probably agree with me that when Michael Gove moved to putting that emphasis on final exams at the end of a two year course, that was risky anyway. And the pandemic proved that it was possibly the worst thing that we could have done. So, so I, I think the whole structure of um, pre-16 and post-16 education is kind of up for grabs, perhaps more than the subjects themselves are. And we need to be aware of that. And it's also a fantastic time to contribute to that um, and to make observations. I think um, for a number of reasons, character education and things that are sometimes called soft skills, but are not soft at all, about relationships and leadership and resilience, they were already increasing in profile, but I think the pandemic has really emphasized those because those were the things that were hardest to maintain when we were working remotely. So, you know, it's, it's not that difficult. I mean, it's, I'm not undermining people do, not that difficult to teach maths and chemistry perhaps online as it is to keep those other skills going. Um, and I also think, and this is a particular um, kind of uh, passion of mine, I think the performing arts will probably come out of this well because there had been this massive move towards STEM subjects and of course, what's happened in the pandemic underlines that. Tim was talking about the importance of science. Of course, it underlines that. But also the experience that people went through in lockdown. Um, you know, I've said quite often, try getting through those months in March and April, May of 2020 without books and music and online theatre. That, that I think people are starting to reevaluate their lives and their experiences. And so this could be a good moment for those other areas to develop as well, that people are appreciating the performing arts. You know, they want to get back to the theatre, get back to live music, get back to the cinema. So, so I don't think it's quite as simple as some things are going to thrive and some things will, will go. Um, but, but I do think it, it's a moment of transition that we all need to be aware of. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean interesting that you, that you, you um, raised the GO curriculum reforms. And Tim, do you think um, that, that, that these reforms need to be revisited? And, 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 and this time, will the, will, the, will the independent sector play a key role in shaping that, do you think? 
Well, I would very much hope so. And very good luck to Sally Ann um, and indeed Barnaby uh, as people who have the ear of government about the necessary um, reforms. Um, you know, w w uh, our, our public exam system is, is obviously a mess and has been uh, for a long time. I think in terms of the curriculum, I I'm going, probably going to be a bit different from, um, from my colleagues. Um, there's a there's a, a guy called Mark Patterson who reformed all of Oxford University in the 19th century. He is um, he's the model for Casabon in George Eliot's uh, Middlemarch, and uh, he says that no sentence had influenced him more than one from from Lily's grammar, which he puts in Latin. Sally Ann will do the translation for us. Concessiae cantabriciam at capiendum ingenii cultum. I went to Cambridge in order to acquire a certain habit of mind. And, and when, uh, when um, in the 19th century, people came to look at Winchester, one, one headmaster went away and said, at Winchester, everything is antique, but nothing is antiquated. So we still have a bit of liberal humanism. It's called div. It has no syllabus. It's what isn't taught elsewhere. It's what you fancy teaching with your group of people. And, and it's not examined. And it, it's about the shaping of character and the shaping of intellectual ideas and a criticality. And, and we put more time into that than we put into anything else. Are we altering that? Yes, because it's needed to respond to uh, uh, BLM. Um, and also it needs to respond to, to, uh, to, to the digital revolution. So um, one of our governors said at a recent meeting, Winchester must not produce literati exclusively, it must produce digerati also. And so there's only one change in our curriculum, and that is being that, that we are putting in um, computer studies a bit behind other schools. Well done then for getting there first. So in terms of curriculum, it's change and no change. In terms of exam reform, well, please let's have a, a, an education secretary who listens carefully. And, and good luck to Barnaby and Sally Ann. Yeah, um, interesting that you, you, you uh, talk about the, the, the importance of digital. I mean. I mean, there's a, there's a profound question, I think, that English education has, has tended to undervalue IT and engineering. Um, and this is a very long-standing tradition. I mean, Gary, do you see, uh, 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 do many of your pupils go and become engineers? Oh yeah, lots. Um, we've got an engineer in residence um, who's devoted to the cultivation of uh, the f engineers of the future. And they, 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 uh, they do that in large numbers. Um, but I agree with I agree with Tim. Well, and, and Tim and Sally, we're all terribly collegiate on this call, and uh, or collegial. Um, although probably a little bit more with Tim on this one. The in a sense, if I <laughs> thinking about Casubon, the key to the Westminster mythology is that we don't teach to the syllabus. Lots of schools say it, and uh, we actually mean it. I mean, we don't. We don't. The, the syllabus, the prescribed syllabus, is something that we tackle en passant. And as such, we cultivate um, liberal inquiring minds who embrace and enjoy both the arts and the sciences, the performing arts, sport, philosophy, you name it. Um, uh, and, and we'll continue to do that. And I agree with Sally there that that sense of subjects ebbing and flowing I think a properly constituted holistic curriculum um, will always give good coverage to all of them and the way they interact and interplay. And that interdisciplinary work is a really important part of it. And yes, so then out of that fulcrum can come exciting things like psychology and, and engineering and, and other things as well. Um, computing is important. Um, all of our year nines do computer science as a compulsory part of that extended liberal curriculum. And lots of them go on to study it in, in uh, when they're older, um, I guess in a sense, in a sense, computer language, computer programming is the Latin of the 21st century, isn't it? It is a way of thinking and a way of interacting with the world and mediating the world that, that any young person really needs to have. So just as those 19th century, or in the case of uh, all of our schools, those ancient medieval uh, ancestors needed to know their way around a Latin and Greek grammar to cut the mustard, so our pupils need to know their way around computer language uh, to cut the mustard and to acquire that way of thinking uh, and interacting with the world that's important. So that, that, that is a, an innovation, I guess, although not a particularly new one. But beyond that, I think that Sally is right and Tim is right that we do need to look seriously at our public examinations framework. And I say that advisedly because we don't, we don't 
slavishly follow them. I'm sure none of us do that. But ultimately, our children do need those qualifications to progress. And the key, really, to reforming what we do in schools is how the universities uh, assess their potential undergraduates. If we move towards post-qualification admissions, post-qualification offers some version of that, which is complicated and controversial and will need a lot of work. If we can do that, that will unlock for schools time and space in the curriculum, which will not require the acquisition of GCSEs in large numbers, whether as a focus or as a side product of a curriculum, because the universities will no longer insist upon having those GCSEs as a means of their pre-qualification assessment. That's important. That's what we need to lobby universities and governments to do. And that's what we are doing as a sector. We're, we're, we're engaged in that process because it could be that could be the key to a new mythology, the mythology of a 21st century educational uh, setup, which really is fit for purpose. Do you think I mean, um, uh, I'll take you up on the on the IT bit. bit. I mean, I, I wonder whether, you know, like a, a teenage Bill Gates coding coding. Uh, you know, which he was doing as a teenager, whether he would have been allowed to do it in, if he'd been in a British independent school like yours, he'd have been forced out to play rugby and everyone would have thought it was a bad idea that he was spending hours and hours and hours in his bedroom writing this code. Um, and well, I, he, certainly, he certainly wouldn't have done, I mean, he wouldn't have been forced to play rugby at my school because we don't do it. Um, but he wouldn't have been forced to do anything. The point about a liberal education and one of the things that independent schools, I think, do well is that we, we do allow the children to develop their interests and passions with our support. So we don't rigorously, you know, we don't prescribe a curriculum that forces every child to be the same. We allow every child to be individual. So the Bill Gateses should flourish in a school like St Paul's or Winchester or Westminster. Absolutely would, I'm sure, and do. We do nurture kids like that. And so we should. That's what it's all about. Um, Barnaby, do you think um, the, the curriculum reform is going to be, I mean, will the independent sector have a, have a, a role to play in, in the reforms that are happening? And will Gavin Williamson pull off something worth having? No, I mean, this government is not interested in exam reform. The uh, exams were only reformed five years ago. Uh, independent schools strongly supported the GOV reforms, um, whatever they say now. Uh, if the exam system is changed, it will be changed to suit state schools, of course, who are the great majority of the users of those exams. Um, but I think it's worth re-emphasizing that, you know, all, all of the, these schools, well, all of our schools get very good exam results. I mean, if you look at the uh, dreaded league tables, you'll see that 80 out of the top 100 performing schools at A-level are independent schools, independent schools, council schools. But the real difference between these schools and all other schools, including good state schools, is the non-exam activity that has been referred to. It's the, it's the quantity of music, sport, drama, public speaking, all of those things which generate lifelong interest, personality and skills, you know, 21st century skills. I mean, personally, I think that exams are not going to disappear. I think exams are necessary. Um, they force pupils to commit knowledge to the long-term memory, which is one of the main purposes of going to school. And the alternatives, teacher assessed coursework, which Gove got rid of five years ago, you know, he got rid of them for reasons, which is that, that the teacher assessed coursework was found to be very unfair, dull, put a lot of pressure on teachers. Um, and so it needs careful thought, and there will be careful thought. Um, but it won't be, I don't think, uh, anything that's coming from this government, certainly not this minister, not Gavin Williamson, not Nick Gibb. Great, thanks, Barnaby. Um, okay, let's let's move on from um, curriculum discussion to uh, a more general discussion about innovation and governance uh, in the sector um, and in your school. Um, I'm going to start with Sally Ann um, and ask: um, um, Do you think there's an economic imperative now to be a through school? I mean, do parents like the break at 13? Do you like the break at 13? Um, and and I mean, obviously, you have a, a prep school. Um, do you think do you think this is the way it's going? 
So I, I don't know, actually. I, I feel that, again, it goes back to what Gary and Tim have been saying about our strength really is our independence and that we don't have one curriculum or one structure imposed upon us. So I would be an advocate of parents making the right choice for their child. And so it's fantastic. I mean, here at St. Paul's, you could come at seven, you can come at eight, you can come at 11, you can come at 13, you can come at 16. Um, and different boys are ready to make that transition at different times and we welcome them and settle them in at whatever time they join. So so for me, one of the benefits of having a through school is that there is more than one structure available. And anybody like me who's also been a parent to children of that age knows that a different child is, you know, is, is ready to move or not ready to move according to their individual experience. So you know, I think there are pressures upon us from outside and that, you know, 11 plus is growing, 13 plus you know, is shrinking nationally, although there are some fantastic 13 plus schools in London that, that feed us who, who are very strong. But, but I think one of the things we can do as, as independent schools is, is to maintain that flexibility for as long as possible so that people can make the right choice for their child, as opposed to have somebody tell them this is the route and it's the only route, whether you're ready to move or want to move or not at that stage. Um, I, I do think some some parents really like the idea, particularly in this slightly febrile London market, of, of getting in sooner so they don't have to put their child through an 11 plus or even a 13 plus process. But there are definitely just as many who, who like their child to stay within a, a specialist prep school. And, and we really value the children that come from those schools and have been sports captains and prefects and, and, and so on and so forth by the time they join us. So I think there's a place for everything. Tim, are you, do you, are you finding, I mean, you, is 13 plus your main entry point? Uh, it is 13 and 16, yeah. I, I just come back on what Sally Ann said there. The, the, the strength of our sector is the diversity and the choice that it allows. And if I had a hint for parents about how to choose a school, it would be to say that um, we, we, we just lose our perception of things. Uh, and our, our sense, our nose of, of the world around us, and, and we um, forget what, what fine senses children have. And um, uh, I, when I was boarding house master, I always used to say to parents and boys who came round, um, put, just, just let your young man go out and, and stand in the middle of the green court and hold his nose up in the air and see whether he likes this place, because every school has an atmosphere and he'll be better at telling it than anyone else. And if, young man, you like it, then that's the place for you. And if you don't like it, then don't let any adult ever talk you into going against your instinct. So, so the, the beauty of the sector is the choice. And the beauty of being a parent is you can devolve a lot of that choice to the child uh, uh, and they can never uh, criticise you because it will have been their mistake. Yeah. <laughs> In that sense, I mean... Obviously, the child might choose you, but they've also got to be able to pass quite difficult exams to get in. Um, how do you know, how do you know as a parent whether your child will thrive with that sort of in, uh, task ahead of them? Is is that for me, Guy? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. 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 Okay. Well, um, uh, uh, it would be interesting, I think, to to hear the different methods of assessment that that our different schools have. Um, here we do have the um, independent schools uh, uh, pretest now. Uh, we've had to introduce that recently because of pressure on numbers. Um, otherwise, we have our own exam, but most of all, we interview um, every applicant who we think has shown up well at the pretest. That's about their whole character. It's about everything that they do. It, it, it's not a question of just cutting people off um, at an entry point. You're after building a community of different people who will who will spark off each other. Um, we, we, we want to look at as many data points as possible. And we also want to allow a, 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 a very great degree of latitude to prep school heads or, 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 or heads from uh, the maintained sector with whom we have contact who say, no, this, this child is a late developer. They really are. And then we put places on, on, on one side for a certain number of those. So, so in, in selecting a child, it's a holistic process. You want as much information as you can, and you do want that personal touch, to me, of, of the interview. After all, let's face it, 
um, uh, uh, many, uh, uh, many, many a modern marriage doesn't last as long as the seven years you might uh, spend in a, in a school. Um, and, and would you marry without a little conversation first with your partner? Well, in some cases, yes, but in the majority of successful cases, I suggest no. So um, uh, uh, diversity of method is to us everything. Gary, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, only to say, um, I agree completely that the strength of, of our sector is choice and diversity and parents should and their children should research thoroughly um, in person, online, asking questions, things like this, getting to know people, working out uh, to use uh, Tim's point, which school smells right for them. Um, and they are all very different. We are a, we are a 13 plus and 16 plus school primarily. Um, and I like it that way. Um, at Westminster, the sixth form is as big as the other three years uh, combined. So we are a we're a top heavy, deliberately top heavy school with a kind of pre university atmosphere, um, which works well when the children join at 13. And I like it that way. I like the fact that it is a mixture of uh, boys and girls of borders and day, it's in the heart of London, but it recruits from across the globe. That works in our context. And it works for a lot of children, the point for parents and those children is to visit all these different schools and work out which model suits them. And they will then find and everyone on the call will find the right school for their son or daughter. Um, and, uh, and they will flourish there, which is what we're all trying to achieve. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like being a 13 plus school and I don't see an economic imperative to change. Okay, on the, on the diversity question, uh, staying with you, well, Gary, and I'll refer it across the others. I mean, how diverse is your school, staff, leaders, pupils? Um, and, 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 ha and has admission had a, any sort of biases in it you know, in, in, the, in the past? Um, well, uh, all in. <laughs> All, most independent schools, of course, almost all of them have to charge fees. They're a necessary evil. They're the price of our independence. We, have, we don't receive public monies and therefore to do what we do in the way that we want to do it, which is what we've been talking about for the bulk of this call, we have to charge fees. Um, so what we're all about, certainly what we're about at Westminster is raising significant monies to help us develop endowments that help uh, people who can't pay those fees to attend the school anyway and flourish here. And that's a very important goal um, that we're very, very serious about. Um, during this sort of transitional period when we are building up an endowment and developing our bursary resource, but at the same time still charging fees to the majority of our pupils, um, I think it's fair to say that certainly for my school, it reflects London. Um, it's, it's very diverse in the way it has multiple nationalities multiple languages spoken at home, um, all sorts of diversity, diversity of background and of approach, gender, of course, in our case, um, as well. Um, I, I think it is a microcosm of society. There are areas, there are demographics that I think that we could reflect better. And I certainly think there are demographics within the common room that we can reflect better. And that's something that I've experienced in other schools I've been part of over the years as well. So independent schools in general, I think in terms of their staff probably need to do more to diversify. Um, but in terms of pupils, I look out of the window now as I do, uh, and I can paint the scene for you. I can see the Victoria Tower, the scaffold at Big Ben and the turrets of Westminster Abbey. And playing amongst them are a group of children who absolutely look like the children of a great multicultural cosmopolitan city. Um, and that's exactly as it should be and is exactly what, we've, what we cherish. Is that true in, Win in Winchester as well, Tim? Tim? Sorry? Uh, yes, it, yes, it is true. Um, we, we don't have Big Ben, um, and uh, uh, although there are, uh, I know, plans for reform at Westminster and new building projects, I haven't yet been asked if we, we, we take it here. But yeah, um, uh, Gary's point is the same as, 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 as the previous aspects of this conversation. Um, we, we are diverse, and uh, we, no one's mentioned bursaries yet, but in all our schools, you know, we are seeking to... Um, to, to make sure that our bursary funds grow and that we have a, uh, you know, a, 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 a social composition that is uh, reflective of, of society in, in an ever broader way. Great, thanks. And, and Sally-Ann, um, um, St Paul's has made a, a big play with bursaries and, 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 and set quite a high kind of income threshold uh, 
where you might be eligible. Do you want to talk a bit about, about, about the middle classes and access to your school? Yeah, so I think this is probably an issue for all of us in the independent sector in that we are getting better and better at uh, providing transformative 100% bursaries and there's a lot of focus on that. Um, and we know that there's huge proportions of our parents for whom there's no fee strain either. And it's this middle ground. I think we know that the generation who are sending their children to school now in, in a previous generation, people like doctors, lawyers, teachers would have had easier access financially to most of our schools so that's a problem and that's why at St Paul's we we, we, we do look at support for, for sort of the middle ground as well as at the bottom end although I have to say the money that we raise for bursaries and that we have from donations that will go disproportionately to 85 percent plus but we are conscious of that and, and Barnaby was talking about fees and, and fee rises and the pandemic put um, a necessary halt on that but it is something that's very much in the mind of us as a school and with the governing body as to planning ahead how we can make sure that we still offer um, the, the, the level of program and opportunity to the pupils that they've always had but keep those fees down and whether that's looking at alternate means of income or the way we model ourselves from a business point of view that's very important because we can't just allow the fees to keep rising the way that they were rising before it's a separate issue there's the issue around um, socioeconomic diversity and bursaries but then there's just the general picture of fees rising I mean one of the things that I, I did want to bring up which I thought was very heartening and this happened at both the school I left and the school that I joined during the pandemic is that when we both of those schools gave back the genuine savings of, of being shut as a site to parents and and also offered those parents the chance to to not take that uh, discount for the following term but to put that money into a hardship fund because there were families who would find it easy to pay the fees in normal circumstances and then because of their professions the pandemic hit them and, and I was just really heartened at the way that the families who, who were not hit by the pandemic were happy to contribute to short-term hardship funds for those families that were so so I think although the model is a challenge I do think the communities within independent education they want to be supportive um, and that they want to to have the doors open as widely as possible at all times. Barnaby, do you think um, the sector as a whole is, I mean, obviously these are quite expensive schools, very expensive schools really, in, in, in relation to the sector generally. Do you think middle-class families are, are, are still able to afford private education? Okay, so let's just have the facts that um, the average fee at an independent school in the United Kingdom is £15,000 a year. So that means that half are less than 15000 And in a world where it's normal for both parents to have a paid job, that means that it, you know, it, it is affordable for a, a, a number. Um, but recognising that we want to um, make our schools available to a much wider group than those who could afford the 15,000 or 36,000 if you look at an average boarding school. Um, I'll give you just one figure. 35% of our pupils in our independent schools are on some, some form of fee assistance. So over a third. And on the issue of diversity, 35% um, of our pupils are from a minority ethnic group. I mean, I am a governor of two fantastic independent schools in Birmingham, where the great majority of the pupils come from a minority ethnic group. Um, so in terms of the broader trends, which is where you started this bit of the questions, I would say, uh, I would hope that there will be a growth of low cost schools, much less expensive. There will be, as Sally Ann has said, more free fee restraint. Um, and looking at all our schools as a whole, uh, you know, the number of small schools will continue to decline, particularly small schools in remoter areas. There will be more mergers, that's already happening. And, there, and therefore the larger schools will continue to grow. So we'll end up with, you know, much larger schools on average, fewer small schools. Um, single sex schools and boarding schools, the trends in the last 10, 15 years have been almost stable. Um, you know, the number of children going to single sex, the number going to boarding remains more or less consistent. I mean, it did decline 20 years ago, but it's now not declining. Yeah, uh, um, it's interesting if you dig into those figures, 
but the, the, the age at which children start boarding has changed dramatically in the last Yes. Um, <laughs> it's, it's definitely older, older boarding. I was going to ask Tim actually a question about boarding. Um, um, I mean, it, you know, historically, boarding started because of travel, really, in the kind of, you know, in the medieval period, and, 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 and how difficult it was to get to schools. Um, why do students board? I mean, it's a, you know, let's, so let's start with that. I mean, because it, it sort of, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, sort of became an ethos rather than a, a need. Um, is, it, is it still relevant or is it a sort of post-colonial hangover? <laughs> well, right, um, it's got the unloaded question. Uh, uh, I've worked in day, I've worked in boarding. Uh, if I there were to be only one form of education, I would actually make it boarding. Uh, but we won't have that, obviously. Um, uh, and, and it's great that you've got a choice between day and boarding. We're back to this choice issue. So why board? Uh, I would say three Fs. First of all, function. If, if uh, education is a necessary good, which I would believe it to be, why not do it 24 hours a day instead of eight? Uh, secondly, second F, family. Um, it's quite nice um, uh, 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 sometimes to be able to uh, get away um, from your family and to be with an extended family. Um, so in boarding, you get the best of both worlds. You have a family of 60 around you in at Winchester. You have lunch with that family uh, every day uh, uh, and, and two other meals in the same dining room in your house. Uh, and you get that, uh, that sociability. Um, and then the last F would be the facilities. Um, if you are at day school, then it's going to take you time to find the local tennis court or uh, to go fishing or rowing or whatever it is you want to do. Whereas in a, in a boarding school, you have every possible facility um, on, on the spot. So those seem to me to be the three, three uh, functions of boarding with regard to why boarding grew in a, in a different way in, in the United Kingdom from other countries. I think the answer to that is fairly simple. English education has always had an emphasis on the creation of character. Um, uh, you remember when, 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 when uh, Squire Brown send, sends Tom Brown to rugby, it's not remotely for the, for the exam results. It's for the, the, the development of him as a personality, as a character, as a man. And, and British independent schools have that ethos in, in contrast to, to many schools uh, in other countries around the world. Sorry, very long answer, but um, uh, I, I hope it was tolerably clear. Okay, well, that, that, that brings me on nicely to the next question, because obviously when Tom gets to rugby, he gets appallingly bullied by Flashman. And so, uh, sally Ann, let's, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about um, safeguarding and everyone's invited and how, how, how responsible are schools for what their pupils do in school and outside school? <laughs> So I, I, mean, I, I think we, we end up, it's, it's, you know, it's another very difficult question because I would agree with what Tim said about you choose a school for actually the other skills and the character education and so on and so forth. Um, I also want to support Tim because um, I, I, I chose both day and boarding as a mother and um, you know, my son that boarded absolutely loved it. And I think we had a better relationship with him while he was an adolescent because we saw him at the weekends and I didn't have to nag him to do his work. So there is definitely a place for boarding um, still, um, even though my school is, is largely a day school. But, but to go back to sort of safeguarding everyone's invited, it, it is legally the case that we do have a responsibility now as do state schools for things like bullying that go on outside. If we hear about them, we have to report them, we have to respond to them. It is clearly impossible to entirely control and monitor absolutely everything that 1500 pupils do when they are with their parents or when they're away from school. So it, it's a balancing act really. I don't think any of us would want to step away from for the responsibility we have for character education or in fact for the opportunity that we have for character education. And, and everyone's invited much as it was you know, heartbreaking to read those testimonials. It has been an incredible opportunity to talk about those issues with pupils, with their families. The generation in schools at the moment, they want to talk about those issues. Um, and, and in actual fact, a, a lot of the things on the website are not about current pupils. And, and there's a generation now, particularly of young men, who feel very strongly about the damage caused by misogyny and they want to have those conversations. So, so I think you know, it's an impossible situation for us because we cannot control things for which ultimately we may have a responsibility. 
Um, but we ought to look at this positively and, and say, look, if, if these are issues that society has, then we are part of that society. And in fact, we, we may have an incredible opportunity to improve things, not just for our own communities, but for the wider community by responding. Um, and I, I know that I would speak for Tim and Gary in this, that we, we take this really seriously. And, and HMC heads have talked about this a lot. We've, we've talked to one another, we've talked to experts, we've talked to external agencies. Um, we, we, we want this to be a moment where we do some good. Jim and Gary, do you have anything to add? Um, thank you. Yeah, um, I obviously completely agree with all of that. Um, we do take the issues raised by everyone's invited and before that by Black Lives Matter incredibly seriously. Um, here we've commissioned two independent reviews into, into both phenomena so that we can try to learn and uh, from the past and uh, in, inform better practice and better outcomes going forwards as well. And I agree, funnily enough, some of the most um, um, passionate advocates of, of review and reflection here at Westminster were from some of the senior boys in the school, as well as the girls, of course. Um, so that's important. In terms of the wider question about, uh, about social responsibility and so on, it has to be a partnership between schools, um, parents, individuals themselves, the individual young people, um, who of course have, have agency and responsibility also, uh, and the wider society in which we all work. So in a case like Westminster, which is quite a complicated one, you know, we've got 180 boarders in a, day, in a school of about 760. So there's a significant amount of boarding, both London and overseas. Um, and there's mix between. Some people, they'll board for a term and then go day, or they'll be day and then they'll go boarding for a term and love it for all the reasons that Tim outlines, which are absolutely true. And as a former boarding house master, I know that to be the case. Um, and they stick with boarding. So all those currents... Um, and all those different kind of moments between home and school and school and home and the, and the homes of friends and so on, all of that is very difficult to police unless you're doing it with families and with parents who also take their responsibilities incredibly seriously. The school's chief role is to, is to again, working with parents, is to educate, is to build cultures, is to help children navigate all those pressures of adolescence um, to point out when they're going wrong, to build on um, positives and to positively reinforce good behaviour. And above all, to remember our responsibilities for contextual safeguarding. Um, in other words, that latest iteration of safeguarding, which understands it's not just about what happens in school or even in home, but also online and also peer on peer. All of those complexities and all of those different fora where, where children need to be protected and helped to flourish we have a critical role to play in all of that, but we can't do it alone. It has to be in partnership with agencies, with families, with children. And, and I suspect Sally is right that what's happened in the last year with, with both those social movements, and they are kind of generational challenges in a way, Black Lives Matter and everyone's invited, that's sharpened everyone's awareness that we have a social responsibility to do better here. Um, and I think that will lead to really positive outcomes in the short and longer term. So in that sense, like most heads, all heads on the call, I'm sure I'm optimistic that out of a very painful, difficult situation, an awful lot of good can come and we will all do better in the future and children will flourish uh, as never before. And that's a, it's a wonderful thing. Right. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go to Tim with that. I, I think we've covered that. Quite well. We need to run around a couple of questions before we before, to try and cover as much ground as we can in, in the last 10 minutes. So um, Tim, I'm going to ask you, um, it, it, it is often claimed now that, that, that top universities uh, and to a certain extent employers are discriminating against the top uh, independent schools um, to, to, to get their intakes more balanced. Um, is, are you finding this? I mean, are Oxbridge discriminating against the commission? Uh, well, the stats speak for themselves. Um, these are the uh, Oxford um, stats from a report published uh, by the university recently. And the proportion from state schools rose from 58% to 68.6%. .6%. So it is de facto the case that more that fewer pupils from independent schools are, are getting in. Um, I, 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 I'd say next, um, actually, the press quite often like to drive a wedge between universities and independent schools, whereas in fact, they have much in common. 
Uh, they, they both wish to uh, uh, be independent with regard to their curriculum. They, they wish to be uh, independent with, with regard to their uh, admissions and they wish to be independent with regard to their fee. So it's not true that these, that the, 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 the sector is in any way at war with universities. We try to do exactly the same thing. There isn't anyone on this call who doesn't want to diversify the intake of, of their, their, their school and who doesn't also want to judge by attainment sorry, by, uh, by raw ability, not by attainment. So look, we're doing the same thing. Let, let's, let's be honest about it. Uh, uh, we feel as educators that we have a social responsibility uh, and that education is a facilitator of social mobility. And, and therefore we have many of the university policies. Now the question is 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 whether um, uh, 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 independent school uh, children are uh, uh, really being uh, disadvantaged by this, and and I'd have another question: Are universities being disadvantaged from this? Uh, Oxford is the university that I'm closest to, and, and Barnaby indeed uh, lives there. But um, uh, so while I was still working in Oxford, there were many dons who were very concerned about the fact that some social experimentation was not with um, not 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 working out academically in in the way that uh, that it was hoped. So if you start finding that you're you're selecting the the wrong pupils, you may well um, change your policy. And I think we're already seeing some signs of that. The other thing, um, uh, and then I'll shut up, is over going abroad. Um, uh, uh, the, the globe has become smaller. Um, and, and we are seeing much more interest here in, uh, in going overseas. Um, and indeed, I've made um, two trips recently around American universities and, and generally having been someone who said go to university in the UK, actually, I have to say those American universities are massively impressive. And if I had my own children going through the system again, I would, I would think about moving them in that direction. So uh, apologies, Guy, uh, a very, uh, very long answer, but I have a helpful one. Well, very interesting, it brings you on to the next question, but I'll throw that uh, at uh, Gary. Um, is British education too parochial? Uh, and, and, and particularly I'm thinking there, is China's rise altering what's ne needed? Because you could say that in a sense, the liberal curriculum is a, is a Western European curriculum and, 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 the, and, and the, you know, the global balance is shifting. Um, I, no, I don't think I don't think uh, independent schools are, are parochial. Certainly, I know that ours aren't the ones on on the call here. Like Tim, um, we're seeing an, an, a lot of interest in uh, overseas universities from our from our pupils. And I mentioned the program I've established of developing links with with them and with uh, students as well as faculty and, and webinars and all sorts of things globally. Um, partly to reflect that uh, interest and partly to, to, to develop it and deepen it, because I think Tim's right, those American universities, for example, and China, universities in China are highly impressive, they generate hugely impressive work, and they're important that we engage with them and we want to do that. Um, I think that um, there's no evidence of Westminster of any of any difficulty vis-a-vis -vis entrance to the most competitive universities. I think the point on that question is that um, what's important is that universities are able to see what is authentically good. And as long as schools of whatever color um, can, can produce pupils who can be authentically themselves and impressive academically and intellectually, then they will continue to get offers. And they certainly should do. That's what should happen. And that's our experience hitherto. In terms of um, that parochialism point, I think that um, Westminster, for example, is developing um, a, a series of, of projects in China. Um, and part of what we're doing there is to is to absolutely cherish, promote and champion our pedagogy, our liberal uh, approach to education there, which is a complex thing to do, but a worthwhile one because it, it leads to cultural exchange. It leads to mutual understanding. It is a world away from parochialism. How can you be parochial when you're you're in, in our case, you're a school in the heart of London? and your pupils come from all over the world. So manifestly, we're not parochial, but we don't want to be. We want to both share what we do and believe in with the wider world and learn from it. And I think that is how great schools will remain great and relevant and vital in the 21st century. So, so no, the short answer, <laughs> no. Good. Um, sally Ann, um, actually following on from, from, from what um, uh, Gary was just saying, I, I wonder whether uh, climate change, particularly, is, and the pandemic, is going to alter whether pupils 
will or should travel six times a year around the world for school. Um, and I wonder whether we whether there will become a point where we hit sort of peak globalization of education or will, or will it just carry on? So I, th I think, um, again, picking up on what Gary said, I think we, we are increasingly global all the time. And because we are schools that are fortunate enough to employ great caliber adults and to attract very able pupils, we're always going to make the most of that opportunity. So one of the things I was thinking about, which again is still the lining of the pandemic, uh, is that we, we've established something called Collet Mentoring, which is peer on peer tutoring through an app that was devised by two young old poor lines. Um, and before the pandemic, there was a view that we would share that in West London with our partnership schools. Um, and, and now it's become national. And in fact, we're looking at sharing it with schools in, in South America and Africa. So suddenly the pandemic has, has led us to, to be more ambitious, I think, in terms of our globalization. Um, to go back to um, your question about whether people will still fly around the world for international boarding, um, I don't know is the truth. We'll see that in the next couple of years, won't we? Um, and I do think there's still an appetite for more localized boarding anyway. Um, but I kind of suspect they will actually, because we've been locked down and I know we have to think about global warming and we have to think about what's realistic, but I also think people are desperate to travel and they're desperate to experience other cultures firsthand because they've seen so much through screens like that and they want to get back. And, and I think one of the benefits of international boarding, and I've been involved in international boarding, my, you know, one of my first roles was to be a house mistress at Seven Oaks, which is a really international school, is that you have proper cultural exchange through that it's not paying lip service it's got an immersive quality to it and and i can't see why that would go um and although you know you, you, you've got to watch your carbon footprint haven't you but but global warming and the pandemic have proven that we have issues that are proper global issues that we have to work on together as different nations so to have young people who've been educated globally and and immerse themselves in different cultures has to be important for solving those problems so i suspect there will still be a place for it Great, thanks. I'm going to I, I'm going to finish with Barnaby just a, with a quick question about um, um, overseas satellites of UK schools. Do you think? Um, I mean, that's been a development that started happening, and there are British schools in Dubai and in China. And is that is, is that going to be a way that that, that the sector spreads its net wider? Or well, there are nearly a, there are nearly a hundred um, overseas satellite schools run by independent school council schools overseas, and the number is growing. And some of them are quite new, so the number in those schools is also growing very fast. And there are certainly many more overseas pupils in our satellite schools now than there are in our schools in the United Kingdom. And these overseas satellite schools, you know, are proving to be quite successful. And incidentally, they're very often being used by our schools here in the United Kingdom to raise bursary money, uh, going back to your earlier questions, to enable our schools to diversify more. So, uh, you know, we, we, our schools are still regarded, guys, being amongst the best in the world. Um, and the, you know, I was interested you raised China, but, you know, quite large numbers of Chinese pupils come to our schools despite the excellence of the provision in China, you might say. And of course, particularly large numbers are coming at the moment from Hong Kong, where families are moving to come and live in the United Kingdom. Um, so, you know, we are, we are part of an international system. That is absolutely true. Um, and, and I would say that the overseas satellites uh, are gonna to continue to expand, although there may be problems in particular countries, of course. Everyone understands that, you know, you take a slight risk building a school in China that the government might do something to, or even building a, building a school in the Middle East. You never quite know. But it's, it, it, it's, so it's not without risk, but so far it's working well. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to stop us there because I promised that we would finish at half past 11 and we are coming up to half past 11. So it just leaves me now to thank our panel uh, for an extraordinarily interesting session. And, um, and I apologize that we um, didn't, get, didn't get all the things we wanted to talk about covered. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at, uh, would your teenager thrive better in a city or a country school? Heads of five city and country schools interview their teenage pupils to help you decide where your child would be best suited. And there'll be an extended Q and A in that one for where you can directly ask questions of heads and pupils. This parent forum 
series is building up to our summer fair taking place on the 22nd of June at the Hurlingham Club. Uh, that, that event is a great opportunity to think about what, uh, where your child would best uh, best be educated. Meet, you can meet mission staff from leading prep and senior schools from London and across the UK. Hear speakers from some of the leading London and UK schools. Um, and Knight Frank and Bryn Dolphin are on hand to help parents think through their property and financial aspects of moving or staying put. Uh, visit schoolshow.co.uk for more details. Thank you all very much.